Aren't you glad we serve a chain-breaking, devil-chasing, sin-killing God this morning? Amen? Amen. I'm, I'm kind of excited this morning because I... The, the songs that uh, couldn't have been better choice this morning for the service, and God is good. God is good. And I think that what we have to say this morning is going to help somebody. I know without a shadow of a doubt, somebody. It's, it's kind of funny. We've been, uh, I think we've been members here four years, something like that. Pastor probably doesn't know this, but... When we first started coming here, I had resigned and, and retired from pastoring. I would sit out there where you're at, you know, as, as a spectator. But boy, that urge to get back up and preach just was still there. But I didn't feel like it was proper to ever just come up and say, Pastor, I want to preach. Make a spot for me, you know. <laughs> but you know what? Every single time, God let me know that it's time to get a sermon ready. And it wouldn't be long thereafter the pastor would say something. And it's been that way year after year after year. You probably didn't know that, but God, God is still in control. Amen? So I want to give you a little bit of encouragement this morning, if I can. Uh, the title of this sermon is Condemned Yet Accepted. And that's where we all find ourselves. Amen? Turn with me to John 3.18. Say amen when you get there. John 3.18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your assurance in, in where we stand on a daily basis. And Father, I ask this morning that you'd just anoint this service, that you'd anoint your word, that you'd anoint your servant, Lord, to give that which is needed and that which is, is desirous for you, Lord, that your name would be glorified, that you would be lifted up. And Lord, that we would find answers this morning for victory in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. You know, there's not much that I can think of right off that's much worse than going around with a guilty conscience. You know? <laughs> that was one of the first things that I noticed after getting saved was, hey, that guilty conscience is gone. And man, that alone is like lifting a heavy load off of you. Maybe you can, I mean, I think everybody can think back at a time that they felt guilty over something. Maybe you still do. Maybe you still carry a, a load of guilt. Maybe you're still shackled and, with the chains of guilt and the devil, like he likes to do, keeps reminding you of it on a daily basis. Perhaps maybe even recently. You made a mistake at work or at home or whatever. And that thing is just eating you up. And then on top of all that, you find out that once somebody does discover you've made a mistake, they usually try to rub it in a little bit. You notice how good people are, you know. They do that. And by nature, we live under a cloud of doubt and guilt. Because we've been born knowing that there is a God, a God that demands a, a, an obedient life to him. We also know that in many situations we ultimately have failed God. We fail to live up to his expectations as we know them. I don't know about you, but I hate to fail. I'm, I'm, I was telling my wife the other day, I'm a, I'm a natural competitor. I have a competitive spirit and an aggressive spirit. <laughs> but we won't talk about that. <laughs> but in many situations we have that guilt we carry that guilt and the devil just loves to use that against us all the time but in our 
current situation as Christians, it's much worse than just being a child guilty of something or guilty of some mistake that you made at work because the guilt and the problems that we face now affects our eternal salvation. It can take you down. If the devil rides you long enough, wears you out, it'll take you down. Paul, Paul had just wrestled with his own propensity to sin in these first famous words of Romans 7. Turn with me if you'd like. It's kind of lengthy, but I think it's necessary because it, it kind of tells us where we're at. Nobody is accepted. We're all there. Romans 7, 7 says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary. I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would have not have known the covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I want to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. Been there, done that? Mm Mm-hmm. And if then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil I don't want to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin, the sin nature, that dwells in me. That's it in a nutshell. Here Paul finds himself continually confronted by sin because of the sinful flesh, the sin nature that dwells in him. He can't get rid of it. Despite this feeling like it's now a part of his very being, he wants to be freed from it. He desires to be free from it, but he can't. And this sinful flesh, its efforts to do good works, no matter how good the deeds may be, are not going to absolve him of his responsibility or clear his conscience. And he can't even play the, the devil made me do it card. Because he knew all along what he was doing. Sinful flesh, his sinful flesh continues to bring condemnation on himself because it now puts him directly, and us, directly in opposition as the role of transgressor and diametrically opposed to God's will and his law. Maybe sometimes we'll even find ourselves a little relief. Yeah, how many times have you ever went to the, read the Ten Commandments again, you know? You start to feel a little bit better about yourself because you think, well, you know, I haven't stolen things from other people, haven't committed adultery, haven't killed anybody. And this one is my personal favorite. I'm no worse than the next guy. But then God's law turns around and brings the full force of its fury bearing down upon us because no matter how hard we try to justify ourselves, no matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to do right. Now, y'all looking at me like a a calf looking at a new post or something, but y'all have been there. Every single one of you have been there. You know, you know, you know what God wants out of you. 
And yet you find yourself not capable of doing what you know he expects. And how does it make you feel? Condemned and guilty. Condemned and guilty. We just can't seem to reach that level of righteousness that we know that God wants us to have. And then about the time we start feeling a little bit holy, we start feeling like, you know, hey, I got this, you know. Then we find ourselves lying flat on our face in the mud, looking up and saying, what happened? God, I can't do this. I can't do this. So what in the world are we supposed to do? Where is the rationale in all of this confusion? Jesus was very clear when he said it's not just adultery that condemns, but it's the lust behind it. It's not just murder that condemns, but it's the anger and the hatred that will do it as well. It's not just theft that condemns, because right there in the Ten Commandments, we find that coveting, longing for something that's not ours, does it as well. So God's law then stands against us as our enemy condemning us for the things that we do, the things that we say, and we think. The very attitudes of our heart, our motivation for everything we do are judged and condemned by that law. What's the answer? How do we get out of this mess? It even tells us that if we have broken one of the laws, then we're guilty of all of them. It makes it so very clear because we begin to see just how far we have fallen from what God demands. It's that impact of knowing what the law says that look, makes us look back and say, Man, I can't do this. That's just too much of a load. There's just too much to do. I cannot do it. In fact, Paul says that the sinful flesh... The sin nature is so far removed from what God expects that it simply cannot do anything that God wants. It's not capable. He says in Romans 8, 7, The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what is a person supposed to do? Where are we at? Is there an answer to this dilemma? You get to feeling kind of hopeless. You get to feeling like, man, what's next? Well, despite all of what we've seen, and no matter how hopeless and bleak things may seem, Paul encourages us when he says clearly and confidently in one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Church, if you never grasp on to anything else, you need to grasp on to that verse and hang on to it for dear life. There is your answer. So what in the world has changed things? The law didn't lose its teeth. We're still guilty, and God certainly didn't stop caring about sin, but the difference now is the now. <laughs> Amen? The difference now is the now. He said there is now. That means right now. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Honey... <laughs> that don't get a shout out of you, I think you better take your pulse. <laughs> there is hope. There's an answer. That word condemnation and the word accused are closely related, and we know who the accuser is. Amen? Revolution 12.10 tells us that he, Satan, is already condemned for eternity by the Word of God. And our joy and our victory now lies in our connection to and our position in Jesus Christ. Church, I mean, we could take this to the bank and it would sell. <laughs> Amen. And that, that is what ends the law's ability to condemn us of sin. Our position. 
Verses 3 and 4 says, God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not. There's a qualification. That qualification is for those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Honey, anything you try to do in the flesh is going to fail. Anything you try to gain in the flesh is going to fail. Mm. According to the Spirit. Galatians 3.27 is often used by baptismal regenerationists who use it to support the idea that you have to be baptized in water to be saved. They maintain that baptism is a place where a person puts on Christ and is clothed with Christ. And that it means that baptism in water saves. They teach that being immersed in the baptismal water is the place and the time of deliverance from sins. And that's just simply not true. Let's read Galatians 3.27. Because it can't be understood by itself when we read it alone. It has to be examined in its entire context. So we'll start with verse 24, Galatians 3, 24. It says, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by works. No, by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through what? Faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You can also see that in Romans 6, 3. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. I like being an heir. I don't know about you, but I like inheriting stuff. Never have yet. But, but I know that that inheritance in Christ is mine. I know that one day I will reap that promise. I will gain the benefits of that reward of what is waiting for me in heaven. Amen? Amen. In the Roman society, children sometimes were often committed to, to the care of trusted slaves. And they would uh, happen when they were children, usually starting around the age of six, and would last until puberty. And these slaves were very severe and strict, and they charged with guarding the children from the evils of society and giving them their moral training that they needed as they grew up. This was also the law's function as a tutor until Christ came, and people could be justified in him. The law was a harsh master, not only to the Jews, but to us. How many of you ever tried to go down through the Ten Commandments? I mean, it may sound awfully prestigious to have it hanging on your wall. But usually about somewhere around somewhere, you're going to fall off of that horse. And you're going to realize that thing is hanging there and it's just beating you to death. Because you can't do it. No matter how hard you try, no matter how early you get up in the morning, no matter how holy you feel and you step out that door and you say, world, here I am. <laughs> right around the corner, something's going to happen. just going to smack you down just faster than a... Mm -hmm. It's just a reality. It's just a reality. By faith. By faith. Amen. Why? It's justification by faith alone, not by works. I know that sometimes we sound like a broken record saying that over and over and over and over and over again. But it's true. And people find that so hard to get through their heads to live it out. It's justification by works, by faith, by faith. You have clothed yourselves with Christ. And in the Roman society, when a child who had been under the care of a tutor and reached a mature age enough, they were given a special identifying robe, a toga, that gave them a position in society. It was symbolic of his full rights within the family. 
Therefore, being clothed with Christ is a phrase meaning that the Christian has moved out of the household of the law and now resides in the house of faith and grace. Being clothed with Christ. You notice it didn't say anything about measuring up what you did. Doesn't say anything about your good works. Doesn't say anything about how you tried to be a good person. It says in Christ, clothed with Christ. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not saying water baptism. The original purpose of God's law was not only to show us life, but to show us that we couldn't live that life in this fleshly body. We can't obey the law. I mean, I would love to. I would like to be able to say to you, man, I am one holy dude. (laughs) I get up every morning. I am perfect. But you could ask that woman right back there, and she would tell you different. (laughs) the reality is we can't do it. Sin weakened the law because of the weakness of the flesh so that it could no longer grant life. The law doesn't grant life. The law has nothing to do with life. It could only bring condemnation and death. The flesh, our own abilities, our talents, Or the very problem that he is talking about here. Because the first thing most people do when they run into a problem, when they run into obstacles, when they run into a big old giant smack down from the devil, the first thing they do is they'll get up in the arms and they'll say, well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to... Go ahead, try it, you know. You can't do it. Your want to may be there, but you can't do it. You can't do it in the flesh. So God had to step in and do what the law could no longer do. He had to be the one to bring life to sinful mankind. Only he could do that. And he did it by sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh. God himself took on our human nature. One that looked like every other sinful person here. Except for one difference. He was perfect. He was sinless. In his perfection, he fulfilled the requirements of the law that we had failed to do and could not do. He never faltered in anything that he did, anything that he said, anything that he thought. He was completely perfect. And in the end, he alone could condemn sin in the flesh. He took the punishment for the world's sin fully upon himself when he died on that cross. He became the perfect lamb of God. He became the lamb that was paid the the sin debt once and for all to take away the power of the sin nature. So now in Christ, we have become a new creation. We're changed. We have a new create. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus, buried with him and raised in the newness of life. Jesus was perfect on our behalf and took the punishment of our sins. So we don't have to live in fear and bondage and a guilty conscience or fear of impending doom from the wrath of God. Why? Because we now have been set free. We've been changed. We're no longer counted among those who live by the law of sin and death because we are now, mm -hmm, now, there's that word again, the ones who live by the Spirit according to the law of the Spirit of life. Honey, I don't know about you, but I'd a whole lot rather concentrate on life than death. The Holy Spirit now dwells in us. And His presence reminds us that we are God's forgiven children. We now have no need to fear God because the sin nature has been made completely ineffective by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's why the, the Bible can say you have been made more than conquerors. It's a supernatural thing. It's not in the physical. It's not in the flesh. It's the supernatural moving of the Holy Spirit. And he graciously reminds us of the promise of God that he has fulfilled for all of us in Jesus. In Psalms 103 eight, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he always Have his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Thank God. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his 
steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. God loves us that much. God's love has made such a fundamental and complete change in our lives. We had been, as Paul says, those who lived according to the flesh and thus set our minds on the things of the flesh. But now... There's the key phrase. But now we are those who live according to the Spirit who now set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Mm -mm -mm. As sinful people who knew nothing about God's love and only about God's anger and wrath, we only lived to sin and just thought about sinning and how to sin more and how to get away with it. But now... There's that word again. But now, thank God, we live according to what the Spirit would have us to do, say, and think. We are now God's dearly beloved children. So why in the world would we ever want to sin against Him? Why in the world would we ever want to cause Him grief and sorrow? Because we failed Him. So now the law doesn't just go away when we begin to think, when we become Christians. But instead, its role changes. It changes from exclusively being a mirror, just showing us how terrible we are, which shows up only how greatly we've faltered and how much we've failed, to now it being a guide, a roadmap, a GPS, a reminder, a navigator, you might say. When we think about all that Jesus has done for us, that his work on Calvary has rescued us from the pits of hell and has assured us of heaven, We should want to thank God. We should want to give Him praise. We should want to please Him and to serve Him in greater ways. Our lives, our minds are no longer consumed with just thoughts of, of sin and rebellion. God has freed me from sin. Church, whenever you grasp a hold of that reality that you don't have to sin, sin is not in control anymore. The devil doesn't have that, doesn't have the key to that lock. Jesus has it. Amen. Why would I want to murder or let anger and grudges burn and fester in my heart? Why would I want to continue to live in the dark shadows of society, bound with guilt and feeling dirty and alone? God has freed me from that sin. God has taken away the old man and given me a new heart that loves, a heart that wants to serve him daily and to give him more pleasure, to complete myself in him. My want-tos have changed. Honey, that, you ever want to know, have I been saved? So a lot of people say, well, I just don't know if I've been saved or not. I just don't feel like it. Check your want-tos list. You'll find this starts dropping off. That starts dropping off. Pretty soon you don't want to go there. You don't want to do that. You find that that doesn't please you like it used to. I mentioned to my wife the other day about some movie that we used to like, and, and I don't even remember what the name of it was now, that we used to watch. You know, I thought, that was a good movie. And a few years ago, pulled that back up and watched it again. I thought, whoa, that's awful. <laughs> Your want-tos, your want-tos start to change. Why would I want to steal or cover, covet what others have? Why would I want to do the wrong things? Why would I want to be in rebellion to God? Why would I want to do things that bring misery, not only to myself, but to others? Why would I want to steal? Why would I want to go to those places? Why would I want to do those things? He set me free. He's placed my feet on higher ground. He's given me a new attitude, a new altitude. He's raised me up higher than that. You're better than that. You're better than that. Why would I want anything else in this life to be more important to me than my Savior? Church, you know, you now live according to the spirit of life.
The devil's going to come around and he's going to tell you all kinds of trash. But you still live by the spirit of life. You now live in the knowledge that Jesus has condemned sin by his vicarious death on Calvary. So that you should not be condemned. Whew. You can rejoice in the fact that the heavy load of guilt that you once carried is gone. Or it should be. If your faith is placed in Christ, that guilt is gone because the sin is gone. You are a new creation. You're not the old man anymore or woman or child or whatever. You know that God loves you more than ever. You know that you'll be with him forever in eternity. Honey, that excites me. I still can't wrap my head around even the smallest measure of what that's going to be like. We should always take every opportunity that we have to praise Him, to worship Him, to lift His name up. He's the one that rescued us. He's the one that gave us life. He's the one who saved us from sin and death. Romans 8, 1, again, let me read that. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Honey, it doesn't get much better than that. I mean, that's like a birthday party and an anniversary and all them good things all thrown together. You know, a while back I started thinking, and that always gets dangerous, <laughs> and comparing things. And I wondered what it is that, that Jimmy Swagger is preaching today that he hasn't preached all along. He's always preached salvation by grace and faith alone. Christ and him crucified. We know that. Sanctification was even inferred, even though he didn't elaborate on it, but it was inferred by faith. Hmm. Whether or not he was consciously aware of that, I, I'm not sure. I don't know, but I do know what he preached. I was there to hear every word he preached and taught for six years. I heard all the behind-the-scenes conversations, saw all the written material, and I had to listen to and edit each one of those TV programs at least eight to ten times due to the job I had. So I know what he preached. But I personally believe that it wasn't until later that through his own personal experience and failure to overcome the sin in his own life, that he saw the real need for a fuller experience and a deeper understanding of just what this sanctification process really is and what it does. There's a difference between mentally saying, yes, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. But what's that mean? What does it mean? He realized a very important part of the theological process that we had been passing over far too lightly for far too long. And he realized just like Paul did in Romans 7 that we read. And just like you and I all have to admit at some point in time. A very important core principle. And it's this. That all the energy and the effort. That you can possibly muster up in all of your best efforts. Will never be enough to be able to fight sin by yourself in the flesh. It's a reality. He realized that there's more to the sanctification message than what he had emphasized up to that point. And I'm sure that alone was mind expanding. It was then to become a very, the very power and the core teaching of what we now know as the message of the cross. He learned by personal experience, the same as you and I do, the same as you and I will, by personal experience that all the efforts of the flesh to fight sin will only fail and frustrate any and all the other efforts that we may try to do better. How many of you, how many of you have been guilty of, of New Year's resolutions? And how many of you have kept all of them? Well, it's the same thing here. We, we, <laughs> we mess up and we say... Lord, help me, forgive me, I'm going to do better. I can, I, can, I can beat this. And we go out there and we, here we go. And we get smacked down again. And every time we get smacked down, we get to feeling worse about it.
The flesh can't do it. Psychology can't do it. Counseling can't do it. Coaching can't do it. Any effort of our poor, pitiful flesh that leads only to failure. You and I have to learn just like Paul, just like Brother Swagger, just like everybody else, that it's through a personal experience that although you're going to fail, and it's not a matter of if, it's when. The point is that you don't have to stay down any longer when you messed up. You don't have to lay there and let the devil beat you up and kick you around and tell you how worthless you are any longer, making you feel like a failure because your position in Christ is not based upon your experience but upon your faith. It's not how you feel about it, but it's what you believe. It's who you put your faith in. It's who has become the object of your faith. Your faith has to be placed solidly in Christ Jesus and Him alone and what He did for us at Calvary. There was a, used to be a country song called Jesus Take the Wheel. Well, that's a great plan. Just need to put it into practice, to put your faith in what He's already done for you and understand that it's in Him and only in Him that He's going to take us through this thing to the other side. I'm just getting in the way. I, if I try to do it myself, he's sitting there saying, when are you going to get done so I can get the work done? <laughs> yeah. No. Stop and rest and let him do what needs to be done in our lives. Stop and rest and let him do what he only can do. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through law, then Christ died in vain. Mm-hmm. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved. Through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In this verse, faith and grace are the means. And salvation is the subject. It is the gift. And it becomes the result of appropriating that faith. It's not by works of the law, whether they're ceremonial works or the moral law or any number of other good deeds that we may try to do. It's all of faith in Christ and what he has done. As a young boy, I was raised in a denomination that believed in the sanctification as a second def definite work of grace, that it came upon the believer in an instantaneous second work, which resulted in being fully sanctified and living a Perfect, sinless, perfection life. Whew. Glory, I feel holy already. <laughs> it taught that you couldn't sin. Mm. Glory be. <laughs> Which that in itself is a definite misunderstanding of what First John tells us. Well, seemingly all of that was well and good, at least for those that adhered to that teaching. It was well and good except for one major problem. It doesn't work. <laughs> People are continually driven by the idea that if you did this or did that or didn't do this or do that, then you were living the true sanctified life, thus enjoying the sinless perfection. But for a denomination of people who supposedly couldn't sin, they sure worried a lot about sinning. I don't know. It was, you know, don't wear your hair too short or too long. Ladies, make sure your ankles are always covered, no makeup. Women's skirts had to go to the floor. A hairnet was good, but an old-fashioned Pentecostal bun was better. <laughs> Men, make sure your arms were covered by long sleeves, and everyone just leave the jewelry alone. You remember, you know. But all the while, they were miserable inside and still failing miserably. Because no matter how hard you worked at it, no matter how good you tried to be, they found out just like Apostle Paul and just like you and I that you will fail utterly when you try to do it in the flesh. 
doing good works, doing good deeds, trying to obey the letter of the law, all in trying to earn a measure of righteousness just leaves us empty and frustrated because we can't do it and we end up just all worn out and thinking, what's the use? I'm just going to give up. And we find ourselves just failing again and again. But church, you have to understand this one truth. And it's a powerful truth that you will stay in this race the same way that you got in it, by faith in Christ alone. And what he did for you on Calvary. That's all there is. It's simple. You get in this thing by faith, you stay in it by faith. You succeed in it by faith. My younger brother went off to one of their seminaries to get his degree in theology and he told me that in order to graduate he had to write a thesis for his degree requirements and he chose the subject of sanctification and as he studied and prepared his research on the subject going through the greek and the and the hebrew and all that and he found so much to cover but he found out he said that there was more and more evidence of the assurance that sanctification just like salvation is by faith alone Amen. He was never satisfied with that denomination after that. <laughs> he found that it is a process. We are sanctified when we are saved. We are being sanctified as we daily live out this Christian walk. And our full sanctification will be achieved on that day when we are all changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to be like Jesus in all of his perfection. It's not by works. It's not by obeying the law, whether, whatever the law, but by the same method in which you, we are saved in the first place, and that's faith, 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 and the blood of Jesus Christ. The righteous life that we live, the good deeds that we do, the love that we have for others is only a result of that salvation and sanctification, not as a prerequisite requirement making us holier so that God will look at us and say, oh, there's a holy one, I'll take him. Doesn't work that way. Because our own efforts, our best efforts, are only counted as filthy rags. I used to work with a woman that I tried to talk to her about the Lord and the end times and things. And I'd tell her, you know, that Jesus is the only answer. Salvation in Jesus Christ is the only answer. And she was of the belief, as many others in the world are today. Well, she'd say, I thought it was like a, Balance thing. If your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds, then you made it. And if they didn't, honey, that's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. So how do we wrap this up? How do we reconcile and make sense out of all this? What's the answer? Well, you have to nail it down and ask, am I condemned or accepted? Am I righteous or not? What do I have to do to be accepted to God and to walk this Christian walk and live victoriously? What's the answer? I'm tired of the guilt. I'm tired of the constant defeat in my life. I'm tired of the weakness that I see in my own flesh. Well, we can start by turning to Ephesians 1, 13. It says, in him, not in works, it says in him. You also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also being, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Then we can go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. By the way, you can buy the CD and get all these scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, not through works, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Then we can go to the book of Hebrews. It says in Hebrews 4, 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Ooh, we've got an advocate. We've got a lawyer. I mean, Perry Mason thought he was good. But, man, I'm telling you, we got the lawyer. We've got the advocate. Seeing that we have a high, great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hang on to what you got. Grab a hold of it. 
Don't let the devil take it away from you. Don't let him steal it. Don't let him begin to start telling you those lies day after day. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are. Mm. And Hebrews ten fourteen says, For but one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We are being sanctified. I don't see anywhere in these scriptures, anywhere, that we're admonished to do works to gain acceptance to God the Father. It is, was, and always will be by faith alone in what Christ has done at Calvary. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Paul was pretty forceful when he brought that truth home that he was surprised how quickly the Galatians had forgotten that it was faith that got them saved. And it's faith that will keep you saved. And it's faith that will bring about the working of the Holy Spirit in your life to perfect you, to make you what God wants you to be, to begin to change you from the inside, working on the inside to the outside, to make the new creation out of you, to change you. You can't do it, so get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do what He needs to do. I hate to be blunt, but that's me. <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit can accomplish in you the, the victory life that needs to come as a result to where the object of your faith lies. If you have your faith in your works, you're wrong. You're failing. Jesus and Him crucified. Paul said it in Galatians 3.1. He said, Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, that word foolish doesn't mean just like, Oh, you guy, you know, you're funny. When he said, oh, foolish Galatians, he was saying, you idiots. <laughs> Are you so dense that you can't understand what I just told you? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? There's the question. Or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? There you go again. There's that word. Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Honey, it can't, you can't do it. It ain't going to happen. So let's go back and read in Romans 8, 1 again. One more time. There is therefore... Now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk after the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, is it sinking in? Now, are you getting it? Does it make sense now? Can you, does that put some ammo in your belt? Hmm? <laughs> Sam, if I could have some musicians at the, up here, please. That word, therefore, that he uses at the beginning, therefore. What's it there for? Paul is saying, there is therefore now. Therefore means because of what I've just told you. In Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. That's what it means. Because of just what I've explained to you about Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross because of that truth and because of that reality, there is no longer any condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Honey, I'll tell you what, that's the most powerful passage once you understand what it's fully talking about that you can go to. Write it down and put it somewhere where you can see it day after day after day after day. There is therefore now no condemnation. So are you tired of carrying that load of guilt and shame? Are you tired of it? And I know I'm talking to somebody here today. You may be saved. You may love the Lord with all your heart. But the devil's kicking you around like a worn out soccer ball. He's convinced you that you're just not going to make it. You did this and you did that. And he constantly just beats you up with it. 
sadly, that's a mistake that a lot of parents try to make in controlling their kids. Is to use guilt. But that's exactly what the devil does to those who are still trying to live in the flesh. Who are still trying to earn their righteousness. To earn that feeling of being holy. When they're trying to win this battle over sin by themselves. He lays guilt on you. And he then ends up just regaining control again. Because that guilt is eventually just going to eat you alive. And the more you give in to it, the more you believe what he says, the more guilt he lays on you. Brother Rodney used a verse a couple of weeks ago that certainly bears repeating here. It was from James 4, 7. It says, therefore, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Two things are called out here for us to do. Submit to God and resist the devil. That's our responsibility. Submit to God and resist the devil. You've got to take up some action there and do it yourself. Submission is always necessary for salvation, for baptism in the Holy Spirit, for sanctification. So the question today then is this. Are you going to continue to believe what the devil says about you or are you going to declare what God says about you? You can go on beating yourself up with guilt and trying to gain some measure of righteousness by being good or you can simply rest in what Christ has already done for you. You know, it's one thing to be condemned and feel that heavy load of guilt. There's quite another to be forgiven washed, freed of that load of guilt in your life. And it's that freedom that assures us that in Christ Jesus, we are accepted, we are forgiven, and we can enjoy that freedom. Not because we're daily striving to be righteous, but simply because of what Christ did for us at Calvary. And that, my friend, is the beginning of victory. That's what it takes. Are you ready to give it up? Are you ready to lay down that guilt? Are you ready to tell the devil no more? I ain't playing your games no more. I'm free in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. Stand to your feet. I know that there are some here this morning that are dealing with exactly what I've talked about. You may be saved. You may love the Lord. You may desire fully to serve Him. But the devil's got you by the throat. He's reminding you of every mistake you ever made. He's dragging your mind through the dirt and the gutters, and he's trying to tell you that you're a failure. He's loading you up with guilt and condemnation. I know, because I was once there. You can be free this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you, and I'm not going to take any more time than what I already have. But if that's you this morning, I want us just all to lift our hands, and whatever, when they sing whatever they're going to sing, I want you to say right now, right here, devil, it's over. I am free. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, we praise you this morning. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for that gift that you have got. Lord, give us the, that freedom. Give us that freedom from the guilt. Break the chains, Lord, this morning. Tear down those walls. Tear down those barriers that would keep us from that freedom. Lord, I pray for each individual here this morning that the devil is lying to. I pray, God, that you would free them in the name of Jesus. Lord, by the blood of the Lamb, I pray for victory this morning in this house. Lord, I pray for a mighty anointing of your Spirit to set those free that can walk again in newness of life and in a freedom of spirit with you, Lord. God, I pray now, break that chain. Break that chain. Break that chain. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Father. Thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. And I'll run after you. Draw me, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you're here this morning, you feel like you need to come forward and pray, these altars are open. We don't run by a time clock. If you feel like you need to leave, you're dismissed, feel free to go. If you feel like you need to come and pray, these altars are open and we'll pray with you. I would rather see somebody here get victory this morning than to worry about what McDonald's is serving at noon hour. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 After Praise Him this morning, church. Praise Him for what He's done in your life. Praise Him for that freedom, that victory that you already have. And thank Him for that victory that He has given to you that you are going to claim this morning. Father, we thank You this morning. Lord, we love You this morning. Father, this work in our lives, Lord, lead this church, lead this body, Lord, into newer heights and the greater things. Lord, that your name, your word would be proclaimed in the city of Wichita and surrounding areas, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's hard sometimes to know what to do when the Holy Spirit is moving. It, it just a wonderful feeling to be able to bathe in his presence church if you don't take away from here this morning the message that God has laid out you need to get that CD and listen to it all over again then he has given us freedom he has given us victory there's no sense in us just letting the devil run all over us and kick us around and beat us up over things that are under the blood, forgiven, long gone, and forgotten. The God I serve is bigger than that. The God I serve is reigning. He has set me free. And He set you free. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. We thank You for this service. 
We thank you for the moving of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for each and every one that was here and heard this. Lord, I pray that you just move mightily in their minds, in their hearts, in their spirit, Lord. Victory is ours in the name of Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.